Hello, David McMillan here, and I have for you uh, interview seven of the long-running Sean Atwood and David McMillan series, which runs for about two hours. In part seven, I'm in Karachi Central Jail. Yes, you're probably sick of the place, but if you're unfamiliar with it, this is a good introduction. An escape from the prison in Thailand, that was more of a mechanical exercise, but I found everything I really knew about getting out of trouble, and especially prisons, was fundamentally, well, incomplete, as the physicists say. I realized, although I could run away from the place, I would only be running into the hands of other captors, in a way. Yep, for all the cooperation I'd get if I was a prisoner on the run there, in some ways it would be worse than being inside in terms of freedom. And you'll find that, in fact, for some people it was. For example, there's a banker in there. Um, he was the head of the Mehran Bank. Swindled it of $250 million. Now, <laughs> well, he got charged. Why? Well, because he couldn't bribe his way out, but because somebody bribed somebody else to make sure he was charged. And he built himself an actual house inside the prison. He really didn't mind being there. It had air conditioning, satellite dishes, he had servants, a nice garden. Uh, after the horrors of first getting there, I found myself going there, well, for Sunday lunches, and quite a spooky little gathering that was, as you'll find out. But not really in the first hour, where I'm struggling to come to terms with my betrayal, my uncanny arrest, they usually are, and what I was really facing. I find out in the first hour of part seven, the interviews with Sean Atwood. I'll see you at half time. David Macmillan is the guest that has been on this podcast the most. I receive constant messages saying, when's David coming back on? You left us hanging last time. People are mesmerized by his Queen's English voice from Australia. And it helps that Sean keeps me locked up in another room. Uh, <laughs> those chains are a bit tight, Sean. Thanks for taking them off. And he's back this time minus some body parts. Oh, yes. I, um, I usually dispense with some organ that I have no use for. They'll draw the line somewhere. Um, and it was a gallbladder that uh, I was really talked into uh, getting rid of wasn't doing anything. But what happens is if you've got gallstones and a piece of it comes off, it can get stuck in a little bile duct and that causes a lot of agony. What's it all about? Bile is used to digest fats. Now, I'm not a big fat eater, so my only use for bile was usually the next morning after a massive bender when you've got nothing left to throw up. So bile comes to the rescue. Horrible green stuff it is. So I'm happy to be rid of it. Did you bring the stones with you so we could do a giveaway at the end of this podcast? Well, they looked like kind of uh, squishy Maltesers, so I'd, I think only the diehard fans would want those. Did you squish them? I'm, it's funny, I thought of that. Um, I did with some kidney stones I had years ago. You know, a lot of people have clicked off by now. <laughs> <laughs> I think they come for this on my channel. <laughs> but um, I really had it in for this kidney stone. It was coral-like, uh, crystalline, and it had a lot to answer for because anything that leaves me crawling around on my hands and knees on the floor wanting to die... That's something I want to have words with after. So I tortured it to death, but, you know, it's a rock. <laughs> <laughs> what satisfaction is there in that? Um, don't get them. Drink a lot of water. My urologist used to say, you need at least one pee a day that's virtually clear. Oh. Not easily done. Mm. If you're not familiar with David yet, this professorial, well-spoken, sparkly-eyed, gentlemen is the scum of the earth <laughs> <laughs> yep that's me was the first westerner to escape from death row in thailand no easy feat he's Big got prisoner it was he's got two amazing books out 
Escape. And now Unforgiving Destiny, which covers Escape with a few more things that Escape didn't actually say. So Unforgiving Destiny is the one to lay your hands on. And, and you know what? I'm doing some special signed copies just before Christmas until it drives me mad where people who let me know a few things about themselves, I can write a few clear words to them inside the book. After meeting, what, 10,000 people over 40 years, it doesn't take too much to get quite a clear picture. And I'd had to be a reasonable judge. If I wasn't, we all got arrested. So in the description box below this video are links to all of David's stuff. Please subscribe to his channel. If you want his books, Christmas presents, please go down there. He's providing signed copies. And most books, crime books, are shoddily written, to be honest. But David, as you can tell by the way he speaks, has the metaphors and similes of Proust. Never have I read such fine prose. Well, um, certainly I'm getting better at making it easy to read. Um, you know, really, what you want in a book is something where it is transparent. You're not aware of the words, just the images appear in your head. And I'm kind of getting there. So um, it, it certainly, I had no advice with my first book and it was a little bit, uh, uh, once you know me, it reads well. But the audio books will be out by the time anybody sees this. So the emphasis and the intonation will kind of tell the story, I hope. If you want to fall asleep listening to David's voice at night, we urge you to get the audio books. And <laughs> David's got oh, about 3,000 subscribers on his channel now. He didn't have hardly any. It's growing fast. He's putting more videos up now. And he's got all these different stories from his smuggling days. But now, coming back to what we're doing here, this is part seven. I don't even think we've got a part. Well, yeah, Wild Man's got a few parts. Um, but with the other guests, we've not... We're, does, does he have a gallbladder, though? <laughs> <laughs> I think his gallbladder's about this big. And, and So then. we're at part seven of what you may ask if you've not seen anything with David before. So let me just give you a little summary. At the end of part six... We were in uh, Pakistan. I'd been arrested and thrown into jail there. And his co-defendant, Billy the Boxer, a.k.a. William Power, he called himself in his new Will false Power. Password. Yes. Had squealed. Uh, you know what they used to say? It, uh, policemen cynically say something like, well, it took one slap to get him to talk, but seven to shut him up. <laughs> and uh, Billy Green was uh, a bit like that. And he even uh, amplified the story. Um, somehow to make his own, he, he was caught um, running some drugs, a uh, couple of kilos of heroin at uh, Karachi Airport. So the best defense he could think of was to um, say that he was uh, indebted to some Mr. Big and that I was involved with the Russian mafia. I, oddly enough, I met them after him, but still. Um, that he owed money and gambling debts that I, I don't know how far the story went. I had his wife and children tied up in the basement. He just went berserk. And it didn't help when um, the head of the narcotics section had me in his own dungeon that old Billy had added, oh, he'll have you killed if you slap him about or anything. Well, he rolled up his sleeves and showed his independence from threats. <laughs> so in the previous six sessions, you've got David in multiple contents getting incarcerated and tortured in some and escaping from others. He's got a woman in London, Eloise. Uh, Eloise, yes, uh, Eloise Morse. Well, that's the name I gave her. Um, but she um, she knew nothing of my activity. She was a kind of well-bred girl. I went to a private school, judging from her accent, and um, a, a little younger than I, so um, there was that. But also she knew absolutely nothing about what I was doing. So at one minute I'd be on the Afghanistan border, you know, ducking under the 
suddenly exploding bits of dust around me and and then back with her in uh, Blake's Hotel in London uh, um, trying to dismiss what I've been doing the the last week but uh, no and and she was I was infatuated in love well you're a man Sean what's that mean you know exactly um, but I, I certainly wanted her and by the time it was consummated and we were together um, it was quite a juggling act to perform. And that's kind of where we were last time we spoke. But for people who've walked in from nowhere, I should just outline. Please do. Can I just this, say before you do that? Yes. One of those gripping stories is the shootout in Afghanistan. I don't know if that's part four or part five of his series, but they're all down there in his playlist in the description box below this video. It's the one before last, I think. Part five then. Yeah, I guess so. Um, and that, I won't go into it again, but it um, was one of those things you walk into not expecting anything, leave the room and come back and decide that everybody's kind of changed their position, which was in Jalalabad just after the, uh, just before the Taliban uh, had come in. Um, it was really the Wild West. Um, it was even hard to find a place where um, you could meet anyone. In fact, the guy I'd come back to um, purchase, I had to buy back to somebody who'd been kidnapped. Um, they never use that word there. Uh, they say invited to stay, yes. Uh, if you owe somebody money, uh, especially with the Afridi tribe, they'll invite you around to discuss it and uh, say, well, it's getting dark, you stay the night, <laughs> the next hundred, or whatever it takes to get our money back, you know. Um, so um, a couple of bits of uh, uh, mail I've got since then um, was saying, well, I don't see how anybody could survive dealing in that part of the world. But it, it isn't so... Um, it isn't so threatening as all that. Once you get past the first element, which is you're a Westerner, uh, you must have money or access to it. We'll just keep you and ring out all we can get. If you have to approach such a situation, you really early on have to throw out that the money comes when I get what I came for. The money keeps coming. More money than you've ever seen keeps coming even if you somewhat exaggerate it all. So um, uh, that's kind of where we were. But I, I, I thought we might try. Uh, now, oh, well, the next big chunk, I suppose, of this story is the huge difficulty of getting out of a prison in Pakistan and, and the biggest there, Karachi Central Jail, which was infamous for holding... Well, just about everybody who's been a prime minister or a president of uh, Pakistan has been in there, um, right down to the absolutely most ruthless street gangs, and a completely different approach than Thailand, where it's simple in a way. There's a wall, or seven, and you have to get over them. In the Pakistan jail, there is... Uh, and I'm putting up some photos next week on my own channel, which will give a couple of aerial shots, and you can sort of see how the the prison, built by the British, of course, um, looks almost serene from there, but surrounding it, just dense uh, urban um, populations there. But that wall is guarded by rangers whose job is to stop people getting in, because some of the guests in there so so rich and high profile, people want them. There was a banker there who didn't want to leave because he knew he'd be kidnapped as soon as he, he went out. So he built himself a house there, had servants, very good Sunday lunches and things like that. Slightly creepy with all those spooks that used to come round. The better their English, the more trouble you're in. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it seems to work like that. I, I think when you go to some place mm. a bit rough, I mean, did that apply down uh, when you were dealing with uh, Mexicans and across the border from the US? Did, was there any correlation between if they speak English too well, did that put you off? 
Yeah, you would think that they had some relationship with the gringos, and the mm. gringos are the authorities, the DEA. And Likely the CIA. to be double crossers. Yeah, so the raw local people would be what we would deal with because you could just see, you know, that they were based there and they spoke. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, I think you're right. There is that balance. If uh, uh, if any of our viewers find themselves uh, adventuring in other countries, they should bear that in mind. And that used to apply to Thailand too. There was always some guy who came up in white shorts, saying he was uh, he played on the local, well, it was a police football team, but a football team, and he'd kind of chat you up as you walked around. But he was a, a local informer, and that was his job was. So um, adequate but uh, uh, broken English is good, and you don't want to let on that you know the local language too well. That so makes them think you're suspicious, and also um, you can hear the words, uh, yeah, when we're finished here, we'll leave the body by the side of the road. Um, that's something you want to know in advance, generally. <laughs> but I also thought we could cover... Um, a few things from this great year that will be passing us by. Um, and um, there's a couple of uh, notes I've got here of things that, uh, especially with sex in prison, this has come up a couple of times. I kind of, if I can phrase it, needed you to bounce this off. I, I thought it would be a bit... Uh, I am the guy to bounce sex in prison <laughs> stories off. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, also, uh, what other things have you know, been happening in the year that are of interest? Um, because uh, my own story kind of does go on and on a bit. So, um, well, Would you like to do your story first? Uh, I think that might be the, the other way around. Um, okay. Oh, I did want to, there was just, if I can kill off a few of my uh, uh, notes. You've been studying the uh, Epstein story in depth. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that must have really kept you um, researching on all of that. Your Hannibal Lecter method video got like 100,000 views, I think, more than. Uh, most people are very dismissive. They, um, uh, But it's not easy to uh, kill the usual method, and you know this, to kill, have someone killed in prison. You hire the vicious people who are already in prison and have him killed. If he's in a, a high security or a restricted section, then that becomes more difficult, but you find some nutter that is in there. And, and that's been done, when I was in Australia, that was done a couple of times, um, where somebody didn't like somebody else in the Supermax facility, and they got in touch and, and had that done. What would it cost to get someone wiped out of the Australian Supermax? Um, quite cheap, really. It depends on the personality of the psychopath doing it. Um, <laughs> ravage psychopath fee is around only $5,000. So there you have it. David's been in prisons all over the world. $5,000 to have someone taken out in Australian Supermax. I think the people who had Epstein's non-best interests at heart had more than $5,000. I think they must have been if his Prince death Andrew. was... Uh, <laughs> Prince Andrew. I don't sweat. I don't sweat. <laughs> well, you think his allowance <laughs> runs to that? His allowance. He's still getting an allowance, isn't he now, Andrew? Um, oh, yeah, I suppose so. But he can join the long list of people who groped a teenager or worse and ended well, you up... Could, uh, you could be part of a sex trafficking organization and not spend your life in prison like a n normal mortal. Andrew's punishment is they cancelled his birthday party and reduced his allowance. Very harsh treatment indeed. Um, probably as bad as when uh, Prince Charles was sent to um, Wales for a term of his schooling. No, I remembered a few things going back, and b because this was at a time when I was really busy, and uh, just as the 80s were starting and before my big troubles, um, a lot of things were happening that year, but... I, I mentioned I went to Lebanon. Now, I met a guy there uh, who was part of the Christian Maronite group. As you know, Lebanon's divided up into a lot of, lot of uh, religious factions, but they all get along or used to. Um, 
well enough until civil war broke out. But anyway, he had his big ambition. He looked a bit like Omar Sharif. He wanted to court and marry Nabila Khashoggi. Now, if that name seems familiar, but you can't remember what it was, her dad, Adnan, was a notorious arms dealer. Um, and he had built a, oh, yes, he had a yacht built, which he called Nabila, and that was for her. Uh, Epstein had done some work when he was high in debt collecting, uh, and, and that was in the 80s at that period of time. And he used to, now, you never know, when somebody says that they, they're working for intelligence agencies, <clears throat> generally that means nothing. It, it might mean they have a conversation with some spook and uh, quite happy to feed them some information. But Epstein, as you would have found out by now, was an, in, was an intensely secretive person. Um, I looked up some of his interviews, and they're absolutely empty. Um, he'll show people around that great place he had, the apartment, or house really it was, in New York City, which had, uh, you know, he used to keep eyeballs on display there that he got from London, from some medical collection. As you walked into the, um, the apartment, um, there's this huge display of thousands of eyeballs um, I think it was something the Welcome Collection in London sold off. Um, but uh, he was not somebody who would uh, give away many secrets, so he didn't even drop hints. Of course, there's where the worry was, wasn't it? That when you look at his face just defeated there, was he going to spill? Now, the assumption is that it's the, um, well, we calling it a sex trafficking ring, but um, I think we could string that word around a lot of people in the 70s and 80s who were wealthy uh, and had uh, entertainments, but clearly they were all on the young side. So, well, um, <laughs> they, uh, the assumption is that it was that group, people up high, that would have wanted him disposed of. Bill Clinton. But their <laughs> funny names seem to be coming out of the... Are you sure this is an anechoic room? It seems to be reflecting. I'm writing a book. Yeah. Who no, killed no. Epstein? Yeah. No, Prince but, Andrew or Bill Clinton? Well, research back further because um, Epstein was getting money that was lost back from uh, people who had done secret deals over things. And Khashoggi was one of them, the arms dealer. And he was involved in the Iranian, uh, con no, wait, uh, was it Contra? Iran Contra. Um, yeah, a complicated sort of thing that um, it was a way of supplying arms to, was it Nicaraguan? Yeah, Francis? I've just written about this in my new book that's available for Christmas. Clinton, Bush, and CIA conspiracies from the boys on the tracks of Jeffrey Epstein. Available worldwide on Amazon. Links are below in the description box. Now, the reason that um, I very peripherally had something to do with um, some of the arms dealers, not to deal in arms, but because they had good connections and very good transport links. Now, I got to my late teens, got too close to something and had a, <clears throat> well, a little warning to keep away from um, that little world where American agencies drift off into doing illegal operations outside of the US. Well, those are the things that come up, presumably there are, you know, you can imagine if an agency is doing black ops, I'm sure they're doing them in their own turf as well. But we come to hear of the foreign ones. That little warning to me was, um, I came back to a loft I had uh, right in the heart of the city. It was just like where warehouses were. Which city? This was in Melbourne. And um, at the time I had um, some flights arranged with uh, Thai marijuana sticks coming through. And the uh, DEA were just setting up. And I didn't know it, but the US was already uh, flying through much harder drugs, heroin from Southeast Asia uh, at the 
after the end of uh, the Vietnam War. Did you hear that? The US is flying drugs. This is from someone who was on the ground in that area of the world. I didn't think it was a secret. <laughs> well, not any longer. Um, I mean, the, you know, the secrets come out. Look at uh, Howard Hughes and the Glomar Explorer thing with uh, finding the Russian sub. Anyway, um, and the warning was so frank. I got this, this little loft was my bolt hole. I had it nicely decorated. Nobody knew where it was, I thought. Um, it was a very ordinary door on the outside and opened up into a very cute set of uh, double layered things with sofas and TVs. And I put the key in the door and there was no lock and it swung open. I went in there and within three hours, the place had been transformed back to the warehouse that it began as. I knew that I wasn't hallucinating because the torn wallpaper was there. They took everything, every stick of furniture, all the clothing, uh, ripped down the walls, bits of torn wallpaper, the lamp fittings, there was just the naked light bulb and only one of them. Uh, and I thought to myself, well, I knew they were the Americans, but uh, do I really want to take on people who are willing to go to that much effort to not just have me beaten up or my car blown up or uh, whatever, but to have some kind of thoughtful psychological effect? We will reduce your life to a nothing. You will have nothing if you keep going there. So when I heard the same kind of sets of names connected with um, some of the arms dealers in Khashoggi, I did hear that there was um, a Jewish businessman from New York City who was in charge of collecting the outstanding debts of it all. Now, because those links would have um, really cut through to some well, I, they'd be old, but they all have children. They all have businesses. Things continue on. I mean, you can imagine if somebody's um, a successful lawyer today in the U.S. or a respected person, if their dad or uncle turned out to be you know, deeply uh, admired in um, the darkest of dark dealings, um, and then that company was passed on to him, the tainted goods, and they all had the perfect connections for this. Epstein could not be offed or suicided by some amateur. Um, you know, I, my Sunday afternoon armchair general entertainment is to think how to get somebody out of prison. Um, and I usually try and pick the worst case, you know, somebody like, uh, well, it used to be Noriega or old pineapple <laughs> face. But he died, didn't he? So I, I, I had to move on to um, Shorty, how to get Shorty out of prison. You know, he's in some one of those federal prisons, which is near on all underground. It, it's uh, Supermax ADX. Yeah. From Colorado, is it? It is. You're right. That's the exact one. Um, so when the Epstein thing came up, um, I, I've realized that the only people, only group that are kind of generational and, and pass on these skills and have the connection would have been more likely people like that. See that this, the sex link thing is all good uh, in the sense that that's where people's attention is directed. Um, yet uh, I, I think that might be not going back far enough. So. You know, when you're uh, chasing your leads, if you smell anything that goes back even further. Uh, I think Kushagi was in the unredacted black book. Did I, I said I was going to send you that. Did I send it? Um, not in my email. I'll, 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 I'll do it uh, tonight then. I should look through it, see if there's any names that yeah. ring a bell. Uh, I think it, you're going to recognize be. a lot of names in there. Mm. Um, and I think, yes, I just... Uh, I'd forgotten too that uh, uh, his former English wife of Khashoggi was um, uh, the cousin of uh, Fayed, Dodi Fayed, wasn't he? 
I mean, and <clears throat> these six degrees of separation between everybody get narrower and narrower at, at, at that uh, top end of it, don't they? You can well, that's what's so fascinating it. about the case is, you know, everyone from Bill Clinton to Bill Gates is in there, all the most powerful people. Mm. It's just um, mind blowing. Never has a, a Savile had some connections. Yeah. No one near the connections of Epstein. No. And um, he was so secretive that uh, he just didn't give anything away. So <clears throat> in the sense, we're looking at um, uh, well, who is a suspect in having him killed. Well, you get the phone book and just mark out the ones who are not. Who's because, got the most uh, to lose? <clears throat> it depends. Uh, um, really, uh, there's two levels of losing um, these days. Well, what are, Kevin Spacey, the actor, um, fondles a couple of boys and that's it. His career's finished. Um, it takes very little um, for misbehavior. In a and some witnesses contest. die in his case recently. <laughs> <clears throat> Accidents happen, Sean. Sure, yeah. <laughs> witnesses, uh, witnesses is not a good thing to be, you know. <laughs> Better to be uh, blind and deaf to most things, I think. You know, I see you. Um, I suppose uh, that part of uh, uh, the sexual malpractice kind of led on to another thing. I saw you put up uh, uh, a question of. Uh, do you want a paedophile as uh, should i interview a paedophile yeah, that clip and, that we did yes and the uh, a quick scan kind of told me just about uh, everything is uh, everybody's saying kind of no um <clears throat> and i noticed one of them some kind of stroppy halfwit uh, i forget his name you know i, I try not <laughs> to remember the names of people that i don't like but I'm not going to remember the name, which means you're off the hook, Jack. I don't even know who you are. Okay. <laughs> but uh, he had a go at me for um, telling the story. Not only, well, it wasn't the telling the story about all the uh, uh, being in the supermax and, or, and one of the guys in there saying, I'd screw all of these kids in the talent show. You know, he was a weirdo. But um, I suppose for having a, a sense of humor about it. But... There's two things here. <clears throat> it's a, if you go to, um, if you look at an anti-abortion rally and wonder what this slightly peculiar young man is going around holding a, you know, mock a dead fetus around the place, uh, what business is it of his? Or um, those vigilante groups that are hunting down pedophiles. Like, look, sure, I've thrown a few bars of soap on the iron stairs when I've in a prison when a paedophile's descending or even going up. But um, to actually form a group, some people are hiding a repressed sexual desire in that, uh, I've always felt. I've got a, um, a doctor coming on, a PhD doctor, Sarah Good, mm -hmm. who's going to talk about all of that. She's really yeah. good. She was in um, a documentary called The Paedophile Next Door. Mm. Well, don't you feel some of the most... Uh, vocal, um, uh, the most outraged people uh, about various things. Um, they are probably that way because of something within themselves, um, uh, kind of hiding it. Not only that, I mean... <sighs> Finger pointers tend to be hiding things. That's what mm. I noticed. Snit people accusing others of snitches or snitches. People, yeah, saw that in prison. Also, really, there's another point for this guy. Um, I make light of a lot of things, and I don't think I would have had any sanity uh, today if I hadn't. But I'm sure this twit uh, and his like uh, never really ended up um, in situations where I have years ago. I was looking for Joey Three. He owed some money around town, and... Um, I ended up chasing a couple of uh, dead-end leads. He was supposed to be in a drug rehab center, and then he joined the Hare Krishnas. And um, I kept seeing these, by the way, I kept seeing these two girls there at all these sort of centers where you can book yourself in for three months. And they, I said to them, weren't you following Reverend Sun Mung Moon or something? He was a, the Moonies, they were called. 
they were just joiners, but they gave me some uh, tips to where to find Joey. Well, I ended up at a house, and I'll cut all the middle bit out because uh, it's too long, but I ended, there was a four-year-old girl there, and it was clear to me uh, that his story about looking after her uh, was not right. The look on her face wasn't right. There were, I, I helped myself to the house. This guy was annoying me so much. Uh, I, in my mind, I call him Uncle Fester. He, he didn't have the size, but he had the look. If you've been in prison for many years, there's a kind of a, oh, you sure you can be wrong, but there's a look that triggers something. And I, I looked around the house and there were things about the, the kind of pictures on his next to his bed there from kids' things and all of that. Mm. And here's the dilemma. What do I do next? Now I was young and um, had no sense of humor much about anything, you know. Um, so we'll transition a bit. I was trying to find out who, where she really came from, but of course she was withdrawn not very talkative and then he moved <clears throat> sorry he moved and then i kind of lost a little bit so we'll move to the next scene because i don't want to make a long story of this just to make the point where uncle fester is behaving himself on the floor and i had the girl and i'm saying look he won't hurt you you can hit him if you want you know, I couldn't find anything that wasn't too heavy for her to hit him with. I ended up with a cleaning brush from the kitchen, you know, <laughs> it was long and plastic. And she wanted to, and she sort of took a couple of little swings. But in my mind, I'm thinking, wait a minute, am I underscoring whatever she's been through? Am I, you know, the, the idea was that she could sort of not get her own back, but feel that she wasn't powerless uh, by giving him a, a couple of kitty whacks or something like that before. Um, <clears throat> because I dismissed the idea of harming him in front of her because she'd be traumatized worse. Um, <clears throat> people think this is very cut and dried. It's not. If your interests are in undoing damage that's already been done to a child, you have to think very carefully, not to make it worse. I mean, how many times have we heard the stories about children have been swept into counseling and had magnified something that was properly buried with this nonsense about, oh, it's all got to come out. You've got to relive it to um, deal with it, confront it. Like hell you do. We all have things in life that are better, nicely buried in a little hole. Uh, there are parts of... Uh, when I was tortured that are in a little hole. There are parts of when my uh, wife was killed in a fire uh, that stay neatly locked up. That There's no reason to let those demons out. And that advice came from my 100-year-old grandmother who'd lived through two wars and knew a thing or two about memories. So the thing with the, the girl kind of worked itself off and my driver had a chat to this idiot, Uncle Fester. The, anyway, when mm -hmm. you first came on the channel, David, we were 98% young lads watching the podcasts. Oh, uh, yeah. I think the biggest was 25 to 35 and then 14 to 25. Since David Icke came on and I started doing regular Epstein videos, we've got about 200,000 plus activists who are a third women, mm -hmm. two thirds male, and the biggest age category now is 35 to 45. So I say to those people, David has a dark sense of humor and don't be offended because <laughs> we love his sense of humor. Well, you're going to get a bit of it in a minute because uh, <laughs> um, uh, viewers, um, I've had a disgraceful life, uh, drug trafficking, uh, and part of that has been locked up in lots of jails around the world under different circumstances. How much prison time have you done? 
probably um, 20, over 20 years. And uh, a lot of that, um, half, oh yeah, half of that sentence, the rest of it waiting, you know, the authorities, they're quite happy enough to keep you banged up for a few years, and even if you do get off it, it all adds up in their book, you know, of balances. But um, I suppose during that time, I'm looking at a list of uh, 10 sort of sex in prison, um, very brief things. Top 10 sexual positions in prison, is that what you're talking about? No, that's not on the list, but um, generally it's with one guy at the door watching. <laughs> that's that's the, the common position. But it, I thought, well, let's go back away. I mean, times change. I went, when I knew nothing much about prison, uh, I was locked up on remand in um, a, a jail in Melbourne, and um, it was a huge dormitory. And the guys would get all the, uh, these mattresses down from the beds. There was a crappy old black and white TV set, uh, set up on the corner. And I thought they were just laying them out to be comfortable watching the TV, even though it went off at 10 o'clock. Um, and a kind of little tents were made all over there. And my guide to the place said, uh, uh, Dave, you uh, into the gay scene at all? I suddenly read the room in a different way. Um, and, uh, you know, there were lots of drugs around. They didn't drug test people then. And, but they were kind of relaxed. What seems to have happened in um, prison sex over the years, it's got um, more commercialized, you know, the cigarette business, and also um, more connected with violence. But, you know, that stands to reason. You've got prisons full of um, kind of weird people. But I thought um, if, uh, here, I've got, I've, I've got to point out this. When this, David said he was going to, he might offend some people in a moment, he is going to demonstrate these positions. So you can look the other way now. Yeah, um, we need a rubber sheet at this point. <laughs> no. um, no, it wasn't really that. I thought, okay, what um, people's imagining of, of sex in prison is, um, let me think what they might have seen, Midnight Express, they're kind of idealized. I think he has an affair with some German prisoner when they're kind of oiling each other up or something. What about Shawshank with the... Um the sisters, I can be a friend to you. Oh, yes, that's the other end of it, you know, uh, the, the gang rape thing. But here's a short and pathetic story where uh, I came across, where were they? Um, this pair of idiots that were your average jail idiot in, um, it was in Reading Prison years ago. And they'd actually been through some nut houses as well. They ended up, um, overpowering the, the the nurse who delivered the medicines, and a male nurse or female? A female nurse. Oh dear. Yeah, um, she'd knocked her head and she was a bit dizzy and she was on the floor. So, um, out of the two of them, this was their opportunity for the sex they were denied. Um, one of them started groping over the top of her, pushing her clothes around. It seems like he'd forgotten where to go. Um, the other one jumped on top of the one who was on top of the nurse, pulled his pants down, and got up him. And that was their day. <laughs> now, this is how messed up as it, it, it can be. Um, we're really not talking about people who have conventional lives at all in that way. Um, so they, <clears throat> you, you can't really um, expect that there's going to be any of this idealized stuff. I mean, I'm sure there must be some prison where you know, two guys have met and it's all wonderful. Perhaps you'd read the Marquis de Sade. Have you read 100 and, what was it, 80 Days of Sodom? Um, yeah, I flipped through it, um, but uh, a bit like the Kama Sutra, I, I, if there's not a plot line going, uh, I didn't know. Um, there was, uh, oh, him. 
Because yeah. the Marquis de like to have sex with a prostitute and then get buggered from behind by a man. Ah, uh, at the same time. Yes. Well, that fills every niche in a sense, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, um. <clears throat> and he wrote his book when he was in the Bastille, the prison. <clears throat> when there was a, um, a, one of those prison manipulators I came across somewhere. He was gay. And uh, he told me a story about how he'd uh, held a sharpened toothbrush against some uh, young guy's ear and said, uh, well, it's either your cherry or your eardrum. And he told me, he said, you know, the kid looked around, okay, but just don't tell anyone. Now, that little thing shows a bit of what's going on as well. There's the um, dominance of one over another, <clears throat> the threat of violence. I don't think he would have actually jabbed him in the ear because he'd come to know his way around. I mean, he spent his life in prisons and in institutions. His sex was all inside those places. Uh, he didn't know anything different, but he'd become, in a sense, good at what uh, managing the resources available to him. Um, on the other hand, there were kind of groups that um, came to know each other, and if they had little liaisons and, and set them up. Um, a guy that was in for 20 years for uh, murdering, well, he was in for murder, but I'll explain that in a minute. <clears throat> he, used, he told me of his little conquest sometimes and uh, how if he was the doorkeeper that is standing at the, the cell door while a couple of guys were going at it. Um, margarine was called starter, by the way. Yeah, you get the picture. That's um, called keeping point in Arizona jail. <laughs> is it? If you're looking at the door for the guards for someone, like usually tattooists and stuff like that. Oh, right. Keeping point. Keep point for me, dog. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it's got its parallels in bank robberies, I suppose. And um, its strange thing was, this was a tall guy, very mild-mannered, very easy to live with, as murderers in prison are. Best people to get along with. <clears throat> if they're still there and not dead, um, they've found a way of getting along with people. Now, as, as uh, pleasant as this guy was, he was my neighbor for a while, um, he uh, he was a country boy and had uh, hired on young men as farm workers. And uh, he kept them there. But I think the most chilling bit of evidence against him in court was the body parts they'd found in the refrigerator, including the torso, which he'd take out and have sex with, oh. even though it was headless and legless. Oh. I did ask a couple of technical questions about thawing and, oh. and so on. Oh. Um, and, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, the old claim amongst the gay community, anal sex, yes, all around tightness and three degrees warmer, you know. But I don't know quite how... This guy managed to get anything whatsoever uh, out it's of Jeffrey that. Jeffrey Dahmer esque, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Um, sorry, Jeffrey who? Jeffrey Dahmer, serial killer in America. Oh. One of his victims, he, he would um, keep the body parts all over the house, eat pieces of them, oh. had things in his fridge. And one of his victims managed to get to a phone box. I think he was in like his underwear and there was blood all over him. And the, the police um, came and t took him back to Jeffrey. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm. Thought it was a tiff amongst a gay couple. Yeah, see, an assumption there that uh, was wrong, wasn't it? <laughs> mm, definitely. Um, he ended up, Jeffrey Dahmer ended up, I think a guy with a mop in prison beat his brains in. Mm. Um, <sighs> unhappy ending. But then again, uh, there were... Uh, when I mentioned that guy who was a great manipulator, I'd met somebody else who uh, had his little boy in the prison, and they had a, a relationship that was going on for some months. But the kid 
was uh, transferred to a, a lower security prison. Um, and uh, it was a kind of tearful goodbye. But let's not paint this picture to Rosie. He, uh, uh, the kid ended up uh, in trouble in this new prison and got sent back. So they were reunited. But did it happen by chance? No. Um, the older gent who, uh, in the relationship, had arranged for this girlfriend of um, this kid to take him some drugs into prison. And he had also arranged for the tip-off to happen just after uh, the visit was over mm -hmm. and he was going back to the cell. Mm -hmm. So um, no doubt when they were reunited, he probably would have, the older guy would have said, look, you can't trust people in these prisons. That's why lucky you're back with me. Here, yeah, there, never mind, we'll get over it. So um, you have this strange combination of love affairs in a sense, um, but also the criminality and ruthlessness of, of, of willing to do anything. Um, I, I, th I think one of your stories, uh, um, when, when I was here once, um, somebody had mentioned people having a, a Jay Arthur, a, a, a wank in prison. Uh, I don't think anybody knows Jay Arthur anymore. It used to be Jay Arthur Rank, the uh, film producers. It's very English, that one. Um, and so from time to time, I was in a, a, a four-man room once, and people were swapping stories about, you know, it's bad being prison, all you've got is some dirty magazines and, you know, uh, and what can you do? And another guy saying, "Oh, when you all go to sleep, I, you know, knock one off. You know, I've got to keep myself healthy." <laughs> um, and uh, the uh, one of the because some redhead guy said, uh, "No, no, look, the best time is just before everybody gets out of bed." because it's really quiet before they come around and start opening the doors. And we all kind of just choked on our tea. You know why? Because this guy was always up before we were awake. Now we knew why. Mm. But you know what else I noticed in my mind? Or was it the next day? But when he'd make us tea, he used to get the tea bag and squeeze the extra strong bit out of it for us. Oh. And he... Do you use your left hand, if you don't mind me asking? Oh. Yeah, it feels like somebody else. I said, oh, no, that's the teabag squeezing hand. Uh, Where was he getting his leche from? Um, leche? Milk. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, God, Sean, right, yeah. <laughs> Hadn't thought of that one. We always did seem to have plenty of it. Uh, he was a heavy comer. Uh, um, so... Uh, Oh, yeah, that's true. I'd forgotten about that. Um, <clears throat> I used to be, what shall we call it? Now, I, I've always tried to get um, the best accommodation I can in a prison. So um, sometimes it goes with certain jobs. And in, in, in one place, I, I was in country Victoria in Australia, and the place was called Ararat. And you could call me the entertainment director because apart from being a cook in the kitchen, I was in control of the video machines, which used to feed this little um, high-end real estate where everybody had their own rooms and all of that. And I'd put the porno films on uh, at midnight and just let them run themselves out through the machine. Um, in fact, one of the uh, prison guards used to bring in things until the other prison guards stopped him mm. because uh, he said to me, oh, Dave is a bit over the top, some of these. Well, he was already, I mean, he was into uh, you know, Nazi torture books and all sorts of things, so I had no idea what to expect. <laughs> but they were uh, actually kind of more or less pathetic, um, uh, poo-eating, uh, coprophilia um, uh, videos. You know, I think that 
Netpu is faked. If you have a close look at it, it's uh, <laughs> it, it comes out. But too- well, anyway, I, I think it's faked. <clears throat> but the point of the story <laughs> is that uh, amongst the videos that the guard used to bring in was a whole series of the she males. That is, um, uh, let me see if I get this right. Men in transition to be um, a female. And so they had their own kind of pornography. A few guys used to come up to me and ask, Dave, listen, uh, during the lunch break, can you um, whack that video on? Yeah, sure. Uh, which one? You know, the, um, the, um, the one from... And yeah, I got it already. You don't have to... <laughs> you know, they were hesitating trying to describe it. But those kind of guys were always the heavy gangsters. Uh, so why is that? Don't know. Uh, is there any connection with uh, being a dominating gang leader and um, sexual uncertainty? Or maybe with sexual certainty? Well, my trans know. friend Zena would say that the people who came to her were the biggest, baddest, most homophobic guys. Oh, right. And I did, when I was, I was on like a dictionary spree in prison, I did look up, what was it, you, what did you say, coprophilia? Coprophilia. Scatological. Mm. And um, I think that's the one, is it, that comes from the fish? There's a fish, and there's tiny little fish that follow it around and eat its poo. Oh, right. Ah, okay. I thought, um, I think that's probably the, the scatology word, because uh, corporus in Latin is, um, I think, I think that's kind of feces by itself. So yeah, yeah. scatological probably. I yeah. didn't know there was a fish connection. I thought yeah. you were going to tell me that old story about the prostitute who liked to had clients that used to be enjoy being hit with a mackerel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We could go here forever, but that's um, mild compared to your stories. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll finish on that uh, uh, subject just with uh, a kind of light thing. I, I had a friend in one of the prisons and his girl, very good looking girl she was, she used to come up every uh, weekend to see him and he was getting out in a couple of weeks and I said, yeah, not on a visit. I didn't see him getting dressed for it or anything and cleaning himself up. No, Julie's not coming. She won't be, uh, she never comes on the, the week before I get out. Why is that? Mm. Well, she doesn't say, but she'd be getting rid of the boyfriend. How's that? <laughs> well, Julie can't really live without sex, so you know, I know that there's somebody else. But, you know, we're together. Yeah, we're serious. He just gets the, the flick. So the weekend before is the big breakup. Um, a lot of people probably couldn't handle that, I suppose. Realism, but, that, isn't um, it? Mm, but it is. And, and though that's sort of... You get that one end of the spectrum where it's very casual, and then you get other things. I knew somebody, Peter Gibb, his name was. He courted uh, a female prison guard, um, and she ended up falling in love with him, uh, arranged their escape, was there with a the car. The whole thing ended in tears, of course. <laughs> you know, when they ended up in the countryside, uh, um, staying in inns and places like I mean, come in, uh, people, if you ever are on the run, and we could do a video on that, <laughs> you do not go to some place where there are not many people. It, you book into a hotel next to the police station, <laughs> and the bigger the hotel, the better. Um, it, you know, passing any of those, any luck finding that scoundrel? Uh, <laughs> no, no, it looks a bit like you, but you know, he's an absolute scumbag. You know, <laughs> oh, good luck, officer. You know. <laughs> um, so, the, and I think she used to have sex with him in the broom cupboard, leading to a change of design of broom cupboards. Um, I did see as, that in Arizona. Where a female guard would usher a guy to get the cleaning supplies and then, oh, and, yeah. and then go in with him. There was, um, that happened in another escape case in New York State, I think it was. Um, I forget the name of the town, but a couple of lifers managed to get out. Um, 
by really a, a six month um, cutting and hacking operation. But there was a um, prison workshop supervisor involved in that. Mm. And um, she, I think she was meant to be there with a the car as the manhole in the street came up, but she wasn't. Mm. <clears throat> but it all fell to pieces. It was kind of uh, clear. Um, I think the, the the brains of the outfit of that one was a guy called David Sweet or something. But uh, one ended up dead and uh, the other one was is probably in some, you know, escape proof here, uh, a prison, I mean, uh, in the US. Um, and different countries have different attitudes to escape. A little break here, I thought, just to um, let you go and make a cup of tea or chop up a line, but really, <clears throat> if it's not good enough, we have to squash it with a note and then sort of finally... Ch well, anyway, you're not likely to have anything worth chopping up except perhaps a fillet steak or something at the moment, the way things are. But I'll give you a little bit of a break, and um, when we come back after this first hour of Part 7... Sean Atwood. In fact, I think I'll put markers on these things. What? Yeah. Um, YouTube videos have the opportunity to put little chapter stubs in them. Follow the timeline down the bottom with your arrow cursor. And if this has been done, and not many people do it, but I'll try and make a habit of it, you'll find um, a little notch. And when you hover over that notch, it'll give you a chapter heading. So you know where the hell you are if after an hour you really care. So, where we go in the, the second hour, we've been talking about um, escapes, and it's always a, a, a popular theme, and for me always a popular thing to do if I can possibly manage. And I speak about a few. But while I'm thinking about it, as you stir your cup of coffee, um, most people... If they fail in, in escape, it's not so much that it goes bad on the night, is that they have doubts about whether to do it. And they fool around and really drop clues all over the place. And if that doesn't uh, fail to get them stopped by the guards before they go, or the scheme to get out and to be talked about, They'll tell somebody actually in confidence and to keep it a secret. Well, a prison's no different from any small community, and the quickest way to spread some news is to say to somebody, don't tell anyone, but... So, in a sense, it's a mirror of the larger world, isn't it? And really, back in one place, there was some, a thousand inmates. If you had something to sell, maybe... a everything from a new set of trainers to a mysteriously come by a section of fine eating things. The quickest way to let everybody know would be to tell your best friends, look, I have this thing. I don't want anybody to know. I'd probably part with it for the right price, but let's keep it under our hats, boys, shall we? Well, <clears throat> they'd be knocking at your door two hours later from people you'd never even seen before. And so the way it is with escapes. Hmm? You're all settled for the next hour? Good. Let's see if I say anything worth hearing. And I'll be back at the end to uh, tuck you in and say good night. So what am I saying? The reason, supposedly, that escape's such a bad thing, or serious thing, I should say, is that uh, the public are now in danger from these maniacs who are on the loose. Um, well, as you know, most people in prison are not dangerous, um, not terribly much, more of a danger to themselves. So the escapes where uh, people who are a danger to the public are very few. But mm, and people go with the style and the publicity of the times, and um, people like a manhunt, don't they? Very rarely get them in Britain. We had that one guy, didn't we, who was on the run in the north. I think he shot some police. Oh, yeah. I did an interview on Sky uh, over that. They wanted somebody, um, I don't know, to fill in the hours because they were doing a live coverage. So they had me in a, um, 
a studio with a remote camera. Um, I didn't know whether I was talking to anybody or not, really. It was a bit hard. So, uh, Were you cracking James Bond supervillain jokes on that one? Um, at every opportunity, but they really didn't <laughs> uh, give me much to... Uh, you know, uh, what's it like being on the run, they'd say. And I'd think, well, what's it like for him being on the run? He's... Uh, it's it's quite different here, isn't it? it the population's dense and there's... Um, you're going to come across people. But it's usually... Um, not in his case, I don't think. Didn't they corner him on a road somewhere? And it was a public sighting, I think, that brought him undone. Can't remember. Most people end up making contact with uh, family or friends, and, and that's kind of uh, the end for them. One of your best descriptions, I think, was the Russians who went on the run from the Thai prison, and then how you described the injuries when they were tortured subsequently, when they were recaptured. Oh, yes. Um, when on the, the, the Thai prisoners who got out, or the Russians from Pakistan? Oh, both. All <laughs> oh, right, yeah, because the, the Thai... The, these Thai guys had got out of, they never really got out of the prison. They, they turned themselves in and they were slowly uh, tortured to death over three months. Uh, died of internal bleeding, I'd say, judging from the acoustic. Element. The Russians, you said the bones were like mangled or something. Oh, they were actually the Israelis. Yeah. Israelis! Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, they came back. You know, and the worst part about that, Sean, was that I was at a very delicate stage of my own getting out. And I was reliant uh, on the sheer strength of this Viking-like Swede. So when I was at the prison shop or cafe in, in Bangkok, and I saw these two guys there, and you know, somebody nearby told me, oh, they'd, they'd been caught after getting out of a Chiang Mai prison, and uh, they'd dragged them down there and broken all their legs with iron bars and thrown rocks on it. So they sat all twisted and mangled. I thought, this is not going to go down well with my helper for a big escape coming up. <laughs> I'm trying to make light of it. You know, I went back to my office where the cook had finished lunch and <laughs> so they said, uh, Stan, ha! God, yeah, there's a couple of guys you wouldn't believe what happened to them. I mean, what are the odds? You know, they, they got out, but, uh, you know, and we were only talking about that, Stan, weren't we? You know, have a plan for when you get out, because they didn't. You know, the uh, tuk-tuk drivers had their photo, rough mm. photocopies on uh, on every every building. Um, and um, they ran out of money and they were shopped, turned in by uh, their guest house owner who'd been there. I, I suppose they thought they wouldn't be ratted out by the owner of the guest house because... He was the one who'd been supplying them with the dope. But a eh, big mistake. You can't assume. I mean, this would apply to places you've been, that just because somebody's got um, a lot to lose if supposedly the authorities knew what they were doing, you've got to know that the authorities do know what they're doing. They're working with them. So there's no protection in thinking that... Uh, uh, they're not going to hand you over when it when it suits them, I suppose. Um, uh, across the, um, that must have been. I'm I'm presuming from your uh, adventures that if you went across the border into Mexico, the danger of being tangled up with the um, federales and the authorities there um, was much worse than in Arizona, where it'd be pretty unlikely that anybody be working with the authority. I situated wild man and wild woman down there first. Oh, right. Because they were too hot in Arizona. Mm. And people said, if you put them down there and they behave like they've been behaving in Arizona, the, the Mexicans will kill them. So I go down there and the house I put them in, was, all the windows were completely blown out of it and the house had exploded. I thought the Mexicans had killed them. Right. But what actually happened was they'd had a fight. They'd um, stopped for a smoke break. During the fight, they cracked the gas pipe and boom, the whole uh, house exploded. So we had to send somebody else down there to ascertain what had actually happened. A guy who could speak Spanish, a um, former like, US military sniper guy. And he came back, told me the full story. 
So then I go back down there, you know, now they're established down there. And um, well, I'm, I'm running like tens of thousands of XC pills through this place now, through Mexico. Wild Man has been sold a $10 crack rock that was bunk. He goes, nobody rips me off. Don't go over it's 10 pound or 10,000. And I'm like, look, we've got, you know, hundreds of thousands <laughs> of pounds worth of XC coming through here. Let's just let it go. He's like, no, just drive me down there. Well, I said, I'll drop you off. I'm not staying around. There was police talking to the guy. Oh, really? Yeah. So I pull in in the SUV, just intending to just keep going. Well, man just jumps out, uses the momentum of jumping out the vehicle. Oh, this hasn't slowed him down any, the fact there's police on this. Hill. No, just jumps out, uses the momentum of him jumping out to just smash this guy's head into a, a lamppost, and he just collapses unconscious. I take off, tell Wild Woman, Ten ten dollars of a crack. He's got to be in in jail right now. He's just you know smashed this guy right in front of the police. Mm -hmm. So we're all panicking. We're, we're you know what you know, the, the police going to come here? What should we send some bail money to the jail to get him out? And then he just comes about an hour later. He just comes comes in laughing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know the police are friends of mine. Why did you just drive off like that? All right. So putting them down there established mm -hmm. these relationships with the authorities. If you're a gringo from the UK. And you're throwing around, you know, free drugs to everybody and stuff. Then mm. they, they didn't get robbed because they're they're quite ferocious people as well. No, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, it's a workable balance like that. It I worked suppose. for me, yeah, <laughs> because you're. Uh, it, it's only really when you find yourself targeted in in the way you were that um, it's in their interest to make sure the arrest goes through, which. Uh, I suppose really um, uh, new crooks starting out, you'd think that'd be something they, they should balance that to, to look at the economics of not just their business, but their opposition. Uh, do they appear to be worth investigating? If they detect a, a team following them around, what sort of money and resources is behind that team? Which often enough doesn't it might not have anything to do with them or if you or I were there back in the day, but um, perhaps uh, we'd been doing second stage business for somebody who was very big, and so the operation behind that was huge, uh, and you'd feel as months went on that uh, nothing's going wrong, but it isn't going wrong because the huge case is being built. And when they swoop on the, the Mr. Biggs, they're hoping to turn as many people as possible because that's their focus. So there's your position that um, you're being told, well, <clears throat> you testify against him and that will put the pressure to testify on up the chain. Domino theory. So um, even if you had no ethical position on it, you'd still have to balance out where you might end up. Um, if uh, I notice that people who rat others out have got a very clear two level one where they'll spill but they're not willing to testify uh, and the exceptional ones who will go the whole way generally the ones who go the whole way I mean they're looking at witness protection relocation um, they're hoping to get uh, Everything, a whole slate wiped clean. Went to Kashi Six Nine, the rapper. Yeah, uh, he, uh, he he did that, didn't he? Yeah, he testified against the co-defendants who hadn't took plea bargains, so he's gonna go in witness protection with his rap career. Yeah, you know, boy George said something about his own deal. I never forgave you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else, I thought you're all right. You got a bit of style about you. <laughs> A fink is always remembered, you know. <laughs> uh, he's kind of resurfaced. But I had one um, in my very big court case, which went on for six months, a very cunning double-crosser got his indemnity against prosecution for anything that he might say. And during the course of his testimony, he had voluntarily admitted to years and years of things he'd done, um, covering 
all the crimes he'd just about ever committed uh, that might one day come to the surface. So no prosecution could be launched. It was, um, I've got to hand it to that rat, Peter. He, uh, uh, his name's Howard, that's H-O-W-A-R-D, if you ever run across him. Um, he, he approached it in a very businesslike way. Um, that, well, if I'm going to be uh, giving testimony, I want it to pay off. And he got himself a good lawyer and was advised accordingly and, and came out of it very well. He even said to them, um, well, uh, in the pretrial uh, stages, oh, I know they're in prison on remand, but uh, I, I feel under threat. I think their people are after me. I need police protection. And the reason he did that was because he wanted to continue doing his dope business and had the police crews uh, looking after him, unable to stop him dealing for that uh, 18 months or whatever it was. People learn how to play uh, the system. Yeah. Um, it really, that when, of course, we wanted the jury to know that. And, and they, they thought that this guy, we, in the beginning, they thought he'd served a sentence or it was, when it was explained to them that this was the price, uh, he got all these things for his testimony. And they paid no attention to it. They just acquitted on all of the charges where he was involved. So. It's also created the bizarre situation whereby hitmen, Sicarios, people who've murdered dozens, if not hundreds of people, like Popeye, who was one of Pablo Escobar's most prolific hitmen. They're out. They're doing tours. They've got books. Yeah. Because they yeah. cooperate against the boss or someone really high up. It is a funny thing, though, isn't it? I mean, to murder uh, dozens of people and to be out is a funny mm. thing. Yeah. Uh, the, killing people is really crossing a line because I can understand somebody killing somebody else in in rage or um you know in vengeance for something that was done to their family or somebody very close but uh to make that part of your business plan um it's a kind of complete change in in the whole outlook of, of everything um but uh so I think that um, covers most of the trivia. I did, was. Did you see the interview we did with John A. Leet? Ah, yes, yeah, so a bit of it. Yeah. Well, he was one that came to mind when you uh, mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, clearly, he's on the rubber chicken circuit doing some tours and things like that. Um, he, he, and he seemed quite uh, amiable, but it shows you too. Very, very clearly that the the structure of the mafia's uh, long reach and long memory and willingness to um, pass on uh, their vengeance in a generational way. That is, if uh, you if you crossed uh, Carlo Gambino in 1978 and appeared now, um, there'd be still Gambino connected people um, that would do something about it just doesn't seem to happen. I think a lot of that's kind of a, a, a bit of a myth that, and, and very useful publicity that um, within your organization, if you double cross us, somebody down, even if I'm dead or, or jailed for 17 lifetimes, somebody amongst us will get you. Of course you want people to believe that. But um, the, the bigger crooks, um, I've always found um, their bits of retribution, violence, and killing are often for personal and, and quite often silly reasons. I knew uh, old Ralph years ago, a uh, nice guy, friendly sort of bank robber. Um, he came back with the, the girlfriend he had at the time, who was the wife uh, of a uh, big crook around town turned on the light switch at home, having come back from a Chinese restaurant, put the light switch on, it didn't go on, even though there was a kind of a, a light in another room and hit a second hallway light switch. That didn't go on, but there's lights kind of silhouetting him. Now, I would have been, <laughs> I would have been straight out back where I came or sideways, but mm. Ralph 
thought, I haven't got any real enemies. All my business is straight. I haven't double-crossed anybody. But he was screwing the wife of somebody who didn't like it. Um, and that was what, uh, never found the body. We, we looked. Mm -hmm. But um, in fact, um, I stopped in the Philippines to ask one of the people who was involved uh, to just make his parents a bit happier uh, by finding the body. Uh, but he, he, he wouldn't cooperate, but he was an uncooperative sort of fellow. In fact, his lack of cooperation led to somebody shooting him in a lift in Sydney some years later. He had a friend called Two Tonys. He was a Bonanno crime family bomber, and he was dispatched one day. Um, Joe Bonanno, his lieutenant was Charlie Bats Battaglia, Buried, I like the nicknames. Who'd, good. who'd like left corpses from coast to coast, taught two Tonys all the burial methods, never got caught. But the hairdresser was bopping. This is how two Tonys described it. The, the, the hairdresser was bopping Charlie Bats Battaglia's wife. Mm. So two Tonys was dispatched to bomb the wig salon <laughs> in Tucson, which he subsequently did, but when nobody was there. All right. But yeah, a lot of it is to do with personal. Beefs. Mm. Yeah, it seemed to be. Um, the 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 people who had reputations of, in the Melbourne scene in the seventies, virtually all of their um, uh, murders that came up later, they were just personal stuff, and often um, preying on the the weakest, or or, or and they tell a different story in prison. Oh no. Uh, she, she was in former, she was working with the, oh, yeah, some rubbish like that. But I already knew how, how untough some of these guys were. On that video you put up of mine, that Sammy Cooper story, <laughs> it, in, it's, it has him trying to open a safe that he can't and uh, involved in it. I, our paths crossed in prison when, when Sammy was there. And every Saturday, his sister, and she was a tough cookie herself, the sister. She was, a, you know, the, the few girls in the crook game that you could rely on to have that car engine running. And um, uh, um, I should talk about her at some other time. But poor old Sammy used to get his little parcel of, uh, what was it, a uh, bit of hash, some uh, heroin, a uh, load of pills. It would go in the... Uh, in the suitcase in there, in the internal one, uh, the body stash. And every week I'd, I'd see him staggering around the afternoon with a black eye or something, and he'd been kind of ambushed. Um, and somebody said, so I, I said to Sammy, look, well, you've got a visit, yes, you're sitting, yes, okay. This time, as soon as you leave the visit garden, as it was then, you come straight through. Don't talk to anyone. I know you like to be a good guy, and I know you want to get going on it as soon as you can. Uh, but don't talk to anyone. Come straight to my cell. You can sort yourself out in here, you know, rewrap anything you want, and you'll be fine. Nobody, they'll be too embarrassed to come around. Um, and I'm thinking of all sorts of, you know, jail low life that uh likely to do anything um so sammy gets back fine comes in i let him in i leave the door and i just had the place painted i mean i didn't want anybody <laughs> messing around in there uh sammy's getting himself a little knock at the door what is it uh i said piss off uh go see sammy later on nobody's coming in here uh, it was the, the most desperate sounding tone in the voice was some of the high end gangsters. And they were the most sort of embarrassed. They, oh, Dave is Sam in there. I, yeah, John, John, is that you? Oh, uh, yeah, um, look, uh, then suddenly trying to be casual about it. Look, um, tell him, oh, look, I'll just pop in a minute. Uh, nobody's popping in a minute. And then Sam's weakening. I mean, you do somebody a favor, you get the punishment you deserve, right? Sam said, no, no, let him in. Yeah, let him. And then somebody else, no, let him in, he's okay. I said, Sam, who did you talk to on the way up here? I just, nobody, I just asked, you know, Ernie for works. 
I said, what, you asked a guy to go and bring you a syringe and a needle and all the other, a spoon or whatever, on your way into my cell? Well, this whole conversation, though this little bit of it took nine seconds, there's another three people in the room mm. at this stage, and it's a party atmosphere. It's like that scene in an old, uh, was it the Marx Brothers? Where one of them's got the smallest so-called stateroom cabin on the ship. It's about the size of a wardrobe. And everybody ends into it. And uh, I think in the, in the film, the door gives way and then they all fall out. And that's the gag. But it wasn't far off this because the, the chief of the building, the prison section we were in, had been after me for a while. And uh, he kicked the door in <laughs> because there have been so many people pouring into this room. And it's not a good scene because Sammy's over there in the corner and there's bags of dope everywhere. Uh, and the door's kicked in and this chief has marched into the room and said, got you at last. Well, not quite. In the rush of all these mixture of high and low lights pouring out the door, um, there was the opportunity to, uh, Sammy scooped up the set of works, he wasn't losing those, and said, well, uh, I'll see you later, David. Well, I only had a chance to grab the dope uh, because I knew Sammy would get a attacked again as soon as he went out, which he was, but he didn't have it. Um, and then I had to deal with that. I sort of got out of it, but, I mean, it was such a rush out the door. It was like there was bits of tissue blown by the draft of them getting out in a hurry, <laughs> floating to the ground. <laughs> so he did have the decency to come back on some pretext and uh, palmed it. And and the guards who were sent in had no interest in, mm. in finding it either, mm. you know, uh, because the chief was home. You get in there and strip that place to the ground and all of that. And they looked at me like, as if we give a <laughs> shit, you know. And one said, that it's gone. No, it just walked out with that guy. So. Um, it was uh, another, I mean, this was Sammy Cooper's life. That was just a blinking of a moment in, in, a, in a series. I, I, I might keep that up sometime. And for other Sammy stories, click over to David's channel. Link is in the description box. And if you've got any <clears throat> Sammys in your life, and a few people have told me uh, since then of, um, you know, I, mean, I, I said in one part of it, there should be statues around town to them because they're survivors. Ooh. I think everybody does know somebody who sails close to the wind or worse, and yet somehow it uh, seems to, um, for everyone you have to sadly bury, there's somehow, there's always one that just pops back to life. And, and you've got to admire them, you know. Sometimes back in the old days, I'd... <clears throat> um, uh, Sammy had, had come to me with some incredible story about um, <clears throat> why he had to have a, a thousand or the whole thing was going to fall to bits. And I'd say, Sammy, you've got 10 minutes on this one. Go for it. <laughs> and he'd give me such an elaborate story, you know, and my mind's bouncing from... And why was the radiator detached from the wall? You know, and, 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 what do you mean she was dressed as a man? And the stories were so extraordinary. You'd hand over that money and say, Sam, don't pay me. You, I've just, I, you've just earned it. Well, that's that story. You know, it was really good. Um, and in fact, uh, I suppose out of memorable people, there's that and the very rare. Um, you know, quality villain that um, you come across. Um, and there's only been a few. I mean, I know people like to say somebody was from the old school, um, but um, often there's not. And it always turns out to be something bad about them. But I have come across, old Danny Mac used to be, a, a, he used to, a couple, he set up a, a safe house for some uh, people who'd escaped. And people he didn't particularly like, but just out of a sense of duty amongst the fraternity, uh, they'd blown it. Uh, the police descended. Two or three of them got away. And he again uh, went out and got another safe place for them. So he ended up doing two years over that <laughs> for perverting the course of justice or <laughs> harboring a criminal. I don't know what, that's worth quite a bit here too, isn't it? <laughs>
I think you get five years for that. I'm not sure with the UK stuff. Uh, well, um, <clears throat> I know they take uh, uh, any help given to uh, um, a felon or, or somebody kind of seriously. I mean, the resultant sentences can be, you know, wide ranging, and and sometimes they're very stupid. You know, those the parents of some half-wit kid that had gone over to join ISIS. No doubt he was on the phone and they sent him some money uh, and they ended up being convicted of, uh, what was it? Uh, supporting a terrorist group or something like that. Um, I, did they go to jail? Don't know. I don't, I think maybe even there was a jail sentence in it. And the, the law was so, you know, without exceptions, um, it had never been contemplated that, that that was the case. There was one, and another law that um, can be um, um, poorly applied, there was a policewoman yesterday convicted of, um, was it possessing child pornography or distributing it? I can't remember. Now, possessing, yeah. And she got, oh, I don't know, community service order or something. But um, <clears throat> not that I'm ever in a hurry to leap to the defense of uh, police officers who've got into trouble. It's tragic when that happens. It's really <laughs> tragic. Poor guys. People just don't realize how. No, I can't go on with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, she, her sister had uh, sent something or other about a child being abused, and the evidence was that it, had arrived on her WhatsApp. She said she wasn't aware of it. And that does tell you something about WhatsApp's uh, encryption and uh, its ability to turn up into evidence. A lot of people think it's uh, somehow uh, a safe form of communication. Uh, nothing is. It's no such thing. Yeah. I love the, the, uh, the Dumbest Criminals show, though, where the guy robbed the house, logged onto his Facebook page, and didn't log off. <laughs> That's careless. Yeah. So, what was so important, I wonder, that he had to get onto Facebook to do it <laughs> while he was in the process of burglary? Probably uh, a message from his girlfriend or something. Yeah. I mean, maybe he saw a funny video and just had to come <laughs> back with a zinger. <laughs> he could have. I think um, um, that uh, there's a, some very peculiar laws about. Um, even um, the illusion of freedom of speech, there's a rapper whose songs are subject to um, an order, like an ESBO or something or other. So um, his songs can't be played or um, owned by anybody. They're all in slang that uh, is local to the region. You barely know what the guy was rapping about unless you happen to know those words. You know, the... Street words are very hard to keep up with. Um, uh, I, I'm usually lost. How do you feel about the Spice Girls taking the Gary Glitter song, I'm a leader, I'm the leader, out of the Spice World movie? I love a bit of rewriting history. Um, it go, it's about as lame as the uh, airbrushing of, uh, uh, who was that? Um, Victorian builder, engineer, Brunel. Isn't Bad Kingdom Brunel? Uh, or, I thought you were going to say Jean-Luc Brunel then. No. Um, he built bridges and tunnels and stuff like that. And the famous picture is of him in his stovepipe hat, uh, standing in front of the huge chains of the great western ship that was built, and uh, not very successful sailing to it. But he's got a stogie hanging out of his mouth, a cigar. And all the, because he's a English hero from the past, I think they could have been entitled to the odd smoke, but nope, that cigar is uh, airbrushed out of it. <laughs> so um, I expect there'll be a time. It might have missed the cycle with the smoking thing, but there was consideration that um, Bogart would not be allowed to uh, roll up a fag anymore. Um, but uh, I think we'll see... If it means anything to anybody, we'll see dead actors in films pretty soon anyway. I watched the premiere last night of um, 
the Irishman, the new Martin Scorsese. Oh, my dad's really talking about this one. It sounds it, really good. I am a bit knackered today. You watched the premiere she, of it. Uh, Jeanette said it was, well, when I say premiere, it's shown at the, the cinemas. So it's out now. And Netflix put it on yesterday. Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah. Is it good? Uh, Al Pacino plays Jimmy Hoffa. And yeah. uh, the Irishman in question is um, uh, Robert De Niro, mm -hmm. who plays Frank uh, uh, Sheeran, yeah, who is a union organizer and also buried a few bodies here and there. It's a Martin Scorsese film and it's very long. It's about three hours. Wow. But I mention it in the idea of rewriting history in the sense that um, the technology was there to make them young without using makeup. Wow. They, it, because it covers the periods from what I think about 49, 1949 to the uh, 80s, or late 70s, um, it, uh, yeah, something like that, yeah, to the 80s. When De Niro has to look very old, that's prosthesis and makeup. <clears throat> but when he's young, it's entirely digital. Mm. <clears throat> And very convincing too. I was, I've got a high def set as everybody has, mm. except for poor people. <laughs> and I don't think actually they make anything that's low def anymore, do they? No. I was right in front of it and couldn't see a fault on it. But as one of the critics said, they look like they're meant to be in their late 30s by their face, but they move like old men. Ah, uh, okay. And now that I had that in my head, oh. I was kind of uh, aware of that. Yeah. Um, so, um, it um, it was a, a tiny bit of a spot, but you've got to be in a relaxed mood. You're not going to expect, because um, uh, there's a lot of history and a lot of uh, real names in there as well. <clears throat> uh, Al Pacino is quite, Restrained. I mean, he gets an opportunity to Pacino himself up. I told you guys, you know. Mm. That. But um, <clears throat> in fact, I haven't even really seen the end of it. I, I was starting to to wilt by was about you? one o'clock in the morning because I had to get up and uh, build some camera for some half wit. Is Joe Pesky in it? Uh, yes, he is, and he plays uh, Russell something or other, but Italian. Mm. And uh, very nice performance from him. Restrained the uh, arch behind the scenes arranger of everything. Um, and, you know, they, the two central characters uh, survive, apart from Hoffa, who famously uh, disappeared. And there were um, bumper stickers in the 70s saying, was it 70s? Saying, where's Jimmy? And... Um, People used to drive around you know, because he was so missed. Um, there were even assumptions even then that. Uh, but I think something that was a little bit um, true to life, as much as I know these things on, on the American side, there were quite strong attempts to make him see reason um, before saying, well, you know, if you cross that line, that's it. Um, because they didn't dislike him. And he'd done, what, he got six years for jury tempering or something and, and done it without saying a word to, you know, didn't rat anybody out. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, he hadn't crossed that particular line, but they wanted him to withdraw from being part of the union and, and he wouldn't. Um, I think, too, uh, just... To finish up on that film, um, Scorsese didn't is not happy to admit it, but it is actually a film about growing old. So I'm going to go back and watch it um, in a moment of peace. I hope to get between <clears throat> I don't know 4:45 on Sunday afternoon and an early evening. Um, little Nico's not well. He woke up all rigid this morning. Oh. That's my dog. I filled him full of painkillers. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, looked so bad. I almost had to open the secret drawer. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, I mean, people can come to my door in pain, and they won't leave without it. But you know, not commercially, <laughs> and doesn't transport. <laughs> 
stepping on minefields here. Mm. So, um, is there any other uh, bits of things for the year that uh, um, are worth mentioning? Um, somebody um, did ask me um, to say something I've already said about um, the, the garlic smuggling in Malaysia. Um, there was a time when I was around that... <clears throat> Who was it? Oh, yes. The Malaysian government wanted to protect their local garlic industry and put a 400% du uh, duty on imported garlic. Eh. And we all know what prohibition effectively does. It created a huge black market. So it ended up where there were uh, Zodiac boats and shootouts on, on, the, on the beach uh, over the thing. But um, Many years ago, when bored sitting around with a bunch of guys, we were making a joke about what would happen if you were smuggling sand and you got caught. You know, um, and there was a Scotsman there who said, well, East was on, I like sand and all of that. But apparently there is sand smuggling going on or sand theft, really, mm -hmm. uh, uh, ice theft. Uh, there's a black market in Russia for cheese at the moment. Um, Cheese is one of the imports that was banned. Mm. Uh, and there's places where you have to know who to kind of wink at to score an ounce of Gouda. Uh, <laughs> Emmental goes by weight because it's got holes in it, you know. You can't, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I think that uh, all of those things just go back to um, the whole idea of the stupidity of uh, prohibiting things, um, which very slow moving. I think in the upcoming, we've got elections in Britain, if you're watching from somewhere else, and they're only a couple of, two weeks away. Yeah. About that. And the choice is numbing because we've got real fraudsters up there. Old Boris, who don't think he's ever told anything but a fib, and a kind of ratty old, yeah, would be rabble rousing red that doesn't know what to do with any real power because he's never had any. You know, very unappetizing candidates. Um, but uh, uh, that's kind of what we're stuck with. I can't remember where I was starting with this, uh, the point of the story. Huh? <laughs> you nothing whatsoever to do with that. But I wanted to trash everybody who was on TV before going on to it. But uh, it shows you how much we, we don't care about it. I don't think um, anybody I know is, you know, in, in, in the US, people get very excited about uh, political campaigns and they can really support anybody. I mean, they don't need these big protection squads for politicians here generally because uh, no one cares enough about them to shoot them, you know. They're, they're the biggest criminals, aren't they? Politicians, um, the ones at the top. And, and stupid, I think. Um, More stupid than Prince Andrew? No, that takes some beating the royal family. <laughs> you know, I don't know whether you watched any of The Crown, but uh, that's this. The My mum's in it. Is she? Yeah. Wow. What's she? What's she play? Uh, what sort of character? She's just in the background in these uh, like elegant outfits. Oh, oh, I should have enjoyed some... that. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they filmed some of it in Liverpool. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, so my mum and dad do extra work, like just in the background, like ballroom dancing in the background and stuff. Well, I've watched a bit of it. Uh, no, it must have been fun. Uh, I've watched a bit of it to, just from a, a writer's point of view, thinking, well, if you've got kind of pretty dull material, can you make something dramatic out of it? And, and, and they've done quite, quite well because um, all of the royal characters seem a bit more interesting than uh, I think they were. Somebody I met who would spent some time with them and they'd, kind of dull suburban people who um, uh, are a bit, I mean, Her Majesty's at least held the thing together. But Andrew, oh, that, that disastrous interview. Did you watch it? I've watched yeah. it three times now. The I just bit, keep noticing I, more and more things. Well, I, the, the bit that struck me straight, straight away was he said that he got himself in trouble because, well, the fact is I'm just too honorable. Honor has been my downfall, really. Yes, 
too honorable. I, I think really I could explain away some of my own activities as too honorable. <laughs> People ask me to supply something and out of a sense of honor, I go the extra mile, travel to another country, <laughs> pack it where nobody can see it. <laughs> and in a sense of honor, I take top dollar. Well, discounted, but there we are. It's he, all an honorable. And he was so brave in the Falklands War that his adrenaline spikes so much that he doesn't sweat. So he's honorable and brave. Uh, he's somebody to, uh, you know, aspire to be, really. But really, he was so um, out of touch with. Uh, didn't his own media director quit or something? Yeah. Uh, what about the bit where he says, it, it wasn't a party? It was a straight. It was a shooting weekend. A straightforward shooting weekend. Oh yeah, I know. I, don't we all have them? Uh, 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 how commonplace is a shooting weekend? Generally, the ones I've been involved in, you have to wear, you know, masks and things. And try not to leave any DNA around. But uh, I think he meant something else. He must have, or somebody. I don't know what some of them do get ideas about how something's going to go down. Supposedly, he said to his mother, oh, job done there, mission accomplished. He was proud of it. He thought he had squashed the issue mm -hmm. with his own. Utterly unaware that everything we say, I mean, you know, how many people from who watch um, your channel will throw up the, the the minute and the second that you said something. Yeah. Maybe not to make a big thing out of it, but they're on it. Yep. Now, in the same way, the um, uh, social media, internet age, it's only a few clicks to check something he out. He said, I don't do PDAs. And then on Twitter, within seconds of him saying that, <laughs> all the pictures of him doing PDAs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I only dress casually in London. I mean, I only dress smart in London. I don't dress casually. All the pictures casual. I don't sweat. Pictures of him coming out of clubs, sweating. I think he must be so out of touch with the times. His mind goes back to some dignified interview with uh, a Michael Parkinson type in which you can give a lot of tosh and that won't be challenged. And there's nobody out there, what, the 12 million uh reviewers that you get within a thing now. Um, he really, he had some chance of it sailing past him as you know people went on to do other things. But um, his sponsors dropped him, he's withdrawn from public activities. And next he, thing he'll be suffering a, a mental breakdown and be quietly, royalty like to do that, don't they? They nut their families off yes, um, quite readily. They've got to readily. protect the organism, haven't they? Mm. And um, it was all dying down on my channel until he did that interview. Yeah, yeah and yeah. I just took it all to new heights. You must have thought, you must have woken up in the morning and thought, "Wow, yeah. my prayers come true." Mm. Yeah. Well, not even that. After it was uh, first went to air, I suppose you would have only had to be online to see the froth start to bubble to the oh, surface yeah. on that one. Yeah, and you thought, "Wow." I was a bit worried about in the next week, but it looks like that's taken care of, you know. Because he is the most famous person linked to Epstein. Epstein's nowhere near as famous as Andrew. So by the mm. most famous person linked to Epstein, one of the most famous people in the world, doing that interview, that just brought the spotlight on everything again, 10 times. Mm. I think um, you say it, it seems to be the um, uh, Epstein thing, it, every time it looks like there's some kind of a resolution. I'm after all the guy's dead, so, you know, what could happen next? But something does. The, the, the arrest of Ghislaine Maxwell is going to be the next big one. And is that going to happen for sure? She is communicating to the FBI through her lawyers, and there's been some news stories in recent days saying she may surrender to the FBI or be interviewed by the FBI. I suppose she's the one, though, that um, can, if there's a conspiracy to um, traffic in um, underage girls, she is a, a conspirator. And they then need to find some low ranking co conspirators who will turn against her um, to well, make she, the case. If you, look, if you watched Andrew's interview all the way through it, he keeps saying, I wasn't close friends with Epstein. 
I was a friend of Galen. Yeah. Epstein was Galen's plus one, so to speak. So you can see that Andrew is shaping her up to take the fall. Yes, I suppose um, whether that was witting or not, or he uh, dim witting more like. Yes, I think he was looking for somebody in the middle to. Um, you know, I only came here for the uh, canapé and the, the drinks. Or um, no, I, I knew the guy who packed the cars at that party, and I saw he was working that night and called in. Finding something as far removed from uh, anything that could be guilt. Um, so if she's nabbed by the FBI and she's facing life. You think that'll open up another? Maybe she'll give the goods on Andrew to prevent, to try and save her own skin if it goes that far. Well, if it does come to that sort of point, I suppose what you'll know then is um, the people who didn't want uh, Jeffrey to survive, to repent or say anything, um, if... Uh, if they're involved in her her period of dealings with him, um, then you'll see some black hand doing some, not necessarily killing her off, but intervening in some way or an attempt to. But if nothing is done there, then um, again, I think it it, it might be um, looking to more organized people from, from a different side of things. So there's a whole spectrum, isn't there? She could be suicided. Or there could be a cover up. It was, um, um, uh, it's been, um, probably because I had to look back at 2019 when I was thinking about today. Um, and the, it really, um, there's a transition in, in crime, and probably you'll find with, uh, r reporting on true crime things that um, a lot of the obvious stuff will no longer be so much visible. I think anybody who's anything coming up will be, I mean, they always say cybercrime, but it's more, um, a, a little more complicated than that. There's, there's, uh, this, there will always be the huge drug market until it gets legalized. But it is changing uh, very much from an organized way to be a kind of patchwork quilt of, uh, of people that uh, come together for various reasons. So um, I don't think um, the, the mafia organizations will be in decline. Any big organizations will be the amount of... Um, technically illiterate and electronically uh, expert people that'll be required will shift the whole element uh, in the years to come. Um, unfortunately, we'll be left with these big government organizations that will need to fill their daylight hours with something to annoy us, uh, and they're sure to do so. Um, the US justice system is one of the biggest employers in the world right now. Mm, mm, I, I suppose so. Scary. Um, well, uh, I think I should do... Uh, where are we with time at the moment? We're at two hours, I think. Are we? Do you well, want to do the questions? Um, we what can. are we at? One hour fifty, yeah. One fifty. Well, what have we got left in time? Because... Uh, we've, got about, uh, we've got to be out of here by 7.30, so we've got uh, three quarters of an hour. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just... Um, um, do a little before we go into the questions. I'll just say a little bit about what um, the reason I've um, pushed the Pakistan um, story a little bit ahead. It's quite detailed and is the hardest to get a feel for. Everybody I think I've spoken to has an idea of Asian prisons and. Uh, uh, the Thais, and you know, most people have been to Thailand and they know what Thailand's like. And they imagine um, a prison where there's a significant physical barrier. Um, but where we're going next with this thing is into a world that I'm pretty, I like to think I was somebody who could absorb uh, quite quickly, you know, what a situation was like. But it was so alien. 
it's really, I can only describe it as um, if you ended up in an alternate universe, um, being in the uh, Pakistani jail system would be one. If aliens were, um, had a look alike Earth, but it wasn't. That's how, how different it was. And how um, and I'd bought my way into, and I would have ended up there anyway, as a, as a B class, which is supposedly um, the educa educated class. Uh, I think they describe it in their law books as someone accustomed to a better lifestyle. But you qualify um, if, if you've had a, a higher educational claim to it, um, or even if you're a taxpayer. They're so rare. I mean, families have had their own cousins locked up because they paid tax. Judges agreeing that they must be mentally defective to have done so. Anyway, um, because of that, uh, um, the, the higher level of, of class, you're not handcuffed. So I'd be at court and I'd look around and think, the street's only there. I send my guard shopping at lunchtime. I don't want him under my feet. Uh, I go around talking to people. Um, I can go onto the street, it doesn't bother him. They know you're not going to go anywhere. They figure that if you're of that class, you'll never go to prison for long anyway. Why would anybody run away? I mean, they, they wouldn't like it if they lost you, but they wouldn't panic over it. So the idea that I could be picked up by just about anybody and driven off seemed perfectly simple. But why wasn't it? because I'm in another universe mm. here. All the things that, I mean, my bigger friend, Norjon Magsi, the tribal leader, when he'd go to court, he'd hold court. There were more people putting applications before his private bench than there was in the courtroom. Mm. And secondly, the guards were all um, vetted by his guards, so they wouldn't have him, somebody wouldn't shoot him and then uh, claim that any story that it was somebody else it, it, layer upon layer of complexity um as i've mentioned that to simply end up going to court you have to pay somebody and, th and they pay the, uh, the not just the guards but the prison gate and when you're at the court you have to pay the clerk of court to get you listed before the judge so you've been paying out before you've even got to uh, speak your bit and you have to know so much about all the characters so i had to learn all of this. And I think that's why I kind of wanted a, a longer time in our next session to at least try anyway to have people step into a completely alien world where all the things you took for assumptions about human behavior are wrong. But they also tell you something about our inner um, human behavior and probably our Western arrogance about making assumptions. You no long, you come out of that not with a kind of um, a better attitude about humanity. You don't any longer, if you did before, think of people in developing world being uh, destroying themselves without reason or. or inimitably not not to be trusted it, it does kind of change your worldview not that uh, you don't remember bad things of it don't you sean i, I believe ahmed babush my torturer in karachi yeah, he died in the most extraordinary accident uh, i believe it was down to wedding fire you know the, when people are celebrating they're firing <laughs> guns in the air <laughs> I kind of imagined following the trajectory of that gun, that little bullet, <laughs> as it reached velocity point oh. and then headed its way down, <laughs> picking up the speed until where it left. Mm. Yeah, one of those little accidents in life, uh, accident prone people. It happens. Um, so we'll need a bit of time for that. But as to questions. That's fine. Okay. So this is the first time we've ever done a podcast that has just been a chat. Every other podcast has been somebody's story, usually told chronologically or jumping around here and there. But we've covered some subjects. Which we certainly have. So yeah. I'm, I want to know what you guys think of this chat style. Would you like to see more of this format? Do you prefer just a hard-hitting story read through chronologically? Or do you like just a discussion like what you've heard today? 
please put your thoughts down below in the comments section. If we're a viewer, no like, thumbs down. But don't use that button. It's an ugly button. <clears throat> Jay, I've got a few, but what have you got? J. Ru, how is day-to-day -day life for David now? What are his wishes and regrets? And what would his alternative life have looked like? Well, this many uh, J. Ru, there are many alternative lives, I think, that uh, we all could have had. Uh, but the one he's referring to, I guess, is where I kept a regular job and stayed with it or took another career, um, I could have ended up a pompous idiot like my father. And if you think I'm one now, you should have met him. Um, I think some of the the worst things have been um, oh, but, uh, lamely fathers till poor unlucky sons character building, but it wasn't so much that, but um, stripped away uh, a tendency to be uh, harsh on people. I felt it didn't live up to things. But that question, um, or part of it, also goes, goes to the question of uh, Charlie Manson. Not the famous one, but the slightly less famous one, ex-vet, uh, um, British, who uh, is in touch from time to time with me, who asked me, would I, uh, um, given a choice, have lived any different kind of life? That was the next question from Mads Jada. Would David do it all over again? Hmm. Uh, right. Well, and by the way, I'll just say my day-to-day -day life is, uh, which was part of the first question, is just really busy. Um, I've got a regular job, uh, if you want to call it that, putting in CCTV uh, equipment and uh, dealing with kind of emergency repair things where I can, but only on certain conditions. One, that my invoices are, uh, are never examined too closely, that all materials are supplied by me and never questioned again. And if you ask me for a receipt, you'll get the one you deserve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I'm, I'm getting a bit uh, worn out by that, so uh, I want to keep writing. So buy my crap. Uh, yeah, I need to get this next one up. So that's day-to-day -day life, but that was the regrets question, wasn't it? Would you do it all over again? Mm. Um, what, and I said this to uh, Charlie, um, okay, I think a happy life would be a great one, uh, a content, uh, probably sure it would be good, but this is the price you pay, and you'd know this, Sean. If you say, I will excise that experience from my life, remove it completely, what comes with it is all you learnt, all you came to know of yourself, all the testing you had of your um, abilities, survival capabilities, what with the beneficial, I mean, you might end up with some uh, post-traumatic, something, stress disorder, but we all got that, you know. I got that from episodes of Bugs Bunny. Um, I could do a whole show on Daffy Duck, but that's another thing. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't want to forego that information um, because not only does it make you, but you're privileged in a way to come to have an empathy for things and, and people that you never would before. It doesn't suit everybody. You might end up just a wreck. Um, and I guess I'm a wreck, but I'm a wreck with some insight. <laughs> Definitely. Anne Beck 58 does David Mack have a channel? David Mack's channel is in the description box below this video. Let's click over there, get him some more subscribers. Um, the more I get, the more you'll see me. <laughs> blah, Dob. Question for Mr. Macmillan. What's the biggest package you've ever shoved up your rear end? <laughs> well, as you know, Blah dog, I sound capacious yourself. Um, I'm not a big man, and uh, when pressed, as it were, in an emergency, uh, a pretty small personal stash was uncomfortable enough. I don't, I kind of marvel at what some guys can get up there, um, but it's 
surely painful and uh, why does he want to know anyway you look you can get about 10 ounces up there if you really try grease it up he's he's rooting for you to do the top 10 prison sexual positions i think uh, i i think so <laughs> um there's <laughs> the particular shape of carrot that was popular in the kitchen there. <laughs> uh, not cucumber no too much curvature apparently <laughs> And by the way, according to the cucumber people, I never have it pointing up. <laughs> so Idle Hands is asking a question here mm. in a, a, a kind of literary way that he's written it. Oh, yeah. If change is the one constant in life, what change would you prefer to have seen remain constant? Hmm. As in a good constant change, something that's changing that's always good i think if i translate that right that's what he means um <clears throat> novelty new experiences um and what uh we english and i by english i broaden that to just about the entire english-speaking world um what an older generation like most was to be told that your life's work was absolutely wrong and to have your most treasured possessions trashed by some other's opinion. Um, and so, yes, the change in view of uh, a false assumption would be the best one if he wants to be accurate. Make a man has asked, is Dinga still alive? Oh, Dinga the cat. Well, you'll have to read Escape to find out. <laughs> <clears throat> but... Uh, Ding, old, uh, named after Schrodinger, rather, pretentiously. Um, you know, the cat that was tested on the, 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 the thought experiment. Uh, you put poison in uh, a, a black box and a cat in the black box. And, um, you break the poison jar, and is the cat dead or alive? In quantum physics, the cat is both dead and alive. It's a silly comparison. And I don't think they knew quantum physics too well. Not anyway. Always looking, as asked, it would be interesting to hear what you did in the 24 hours upon your release from incarceration. Yeah. Well, you've had so many incarcerations. Have you got a story from any of those you could give us? Yeah, yes. Well, pretty much all of them. Um, when given the choice after some particularly bad experience and not committed to... Um, keeping on running, changing identity, doing something, having to deal with family, perhaps, uh, or whatever. Um, and I go to a very plush hotel, uh, get a room, and go to sleep. Uh, and have a sleep, and 36 hours later, wake up and um, watch the, eat breakfast, um, watch the news, just get comfortable. Um, wash away the last years and uh, then put on the um, hotel robe. Um, but um, I did something kind of particular when I got out of Thailand in the first moments. When I knew I was entirely safe, I checked into a hotel. Instead of just going to sleep, I couldn't. I was a bit wired. I went up to the rooftop pool of the, the hotel and swam underneath it from end to end. And as I surfaced out of it, as the water drained away, I kind of felt like those years had gone from me too. But if he was referring to some mad celebration, I mean, how many people you know, they got out of the big house and they're on a sidewalk the next day. They've written themselves off. They just get spastic. Years getting washed away from him. See what I said about Marcel Proust earlier, remembrances of things past. And the Madeleine cake. Mm. <laughs> I have a few cakes, but not that one. Mm. Make a Man has posted another mm. one with four questions. Um, I'm not quite sure what this means, actually. How many times have you supplied, knowing full well so-called elites are going to take them? Does he mean that... Um, see what he might mean there. Um, consumers, your customers are elites. Oh, I see. I mean, people that I don't like might be taking my drugs. Yeah. Uh, well, you see, that's how, um, you know, 
Catholic in the old sense of the word, wide-ranging um, uh, people are entitled. E even the, the rich and powerful and corrupt can take uh, my produce. Drugs are the great equalizer. David's products go to all levels of society. And uh, you're right, Sean, an equalizer they are because uh, their true nature might come out uh, when stoned off their heads and people can see them for who they really are shallow and all. Can you get military grade LSD anymore? Military grade must refer to the um, the quality that was used when it was manufactured by Sandoz Pharmaceuticals and used in the testing in uh, what was it, the 50s and 60s. Um, potential um, mind washing manipulation of soldiers. Uh, no, uh, Sandoz stopped making the last lot in um, Switzerland a few years ago. It, um, there is a lab that does, um, and I'm trying to think the location, I think it's in the Netherlands, that if you've got, um, oh, I don't know, scientific or research qualifications or credentials, you can, you can get particular unusual things. But most drugs are made somewhere still. Did you ever get too scared to do something you planned to do? I don't think scared because if you're doing something dangerous, all of us, if uh, we'll say, I'm not letting fear stop me. If I'm fearful, I want to know why. If I not run this through properly, I should go back to the drawing board and check all my preparations. Having said that though, I once was heading to an airport and every kilometer, every mile I got closer there, I was physically ill or ill. By, by the time I got off the motorway, uh, I had to stop and throw up in the gutter. I thought, it, I didn't feel like nerves. It was like nausea, like being poisoned. I went back home, I, I took the hint. I couldn't have lived with myself if so, I'd gone on the trip and it had gone wrong. And I thought, well, you know, the most severe warning I ever got was from my dog, Sasha, years ago, who came and told me, that the police were coming and I ignored her, mm. you know, and, and told her off. I, she wouldn't get back in the house. And then when I let her in, she crept around mm. and sniffed at things and looked at me. And I said, Sasha, what is it? Somebody been here? And Sasha looked at me with eyes that said, I can't fucking tell you, you half wit. I'm a dog. I give you all the clothes, act on them or, you know, die like a sucker. Well, we know what happened. Dan Collier asked, can you ask him about Melbourne Police? Well, it's a generational thing. They, I don't know, um, <clears throat> I would say most of them today from the reports I get um, would say that they're um, a kind of uh, a bit and more dedicated in a strange way, even though the police when I was growing up, they were, there, they were could be quite harsh and they uh, mistreat people quite often. They had a favorite thing with a phone book, put it on your head and then use a truncheon. You'd think that would be um, tolerable, but it's not after a while. Um, they actually killed, oh, I had their name on the tip of my tongue there. They killed a guy just with that. Um, and oh, they did lots of other things too, and they threw typewriters all over. His wife told me that the doctors found his testicles had retracted right inside his body. Um, but they kind of stopped doing that after a while. But I, I think police all over the world have got a lot, lot in common. When they meet each other from different countries, they all, they all like the chase. They all like, uh, I mean, I don't think there are any you know, Sherlock Holmes type who just do it for the problem solving. Uh, and I'd like to think there's a few wasted kind there was, um, that you see in fiction, you know, the, but that's just a, a fictional standard, isn't it? The hard drinking one who's cop, who's got a couple of wives behind him, alienated from the kids, under suspicion, was almost charged with something, went berserk on some, you know, scumbag years ago, who had it coming, uh, <laughs> uh, but is you now dragged back into a case because mm. only he knows that the serial killer used to mm. do this particular thing. I'm just about to describe the plot of, you know, two dozen um, uh, books that are out. But, um, 
policemen uh I got nothing else, don't mind it. But it's a dull job. Uh and the early parts of it are really dull. Uh, standing around doing nothing. So oh. This is from Snobs. He's asked, what's the most ingenious thing you've seen made in prison that's not a weapon? Mm. Uh, ingenious thing. Well, I suppose, <clears throat> on the one hand, I've seen some very well-made uh, jewelry boxes but he with stashes in them. But I'm thinking of um, other stashes that, in the Supermax, people still had a little stash. It was um, used dental floss uh, and a paper clip. The thing you wanted hidden, you had to make kind of flat and long and poke it through a gap in a, a steel bench, drops down the paper clip, uh, holds it with the dental floss. But, well, that wasn't too bad, was it? And probably here was a good place to um, watch it because, uh, well, on Sean's channel, though I'll put the link, I'm sure I will, in the description box below to his set of interviews with me, in the one he's loaded up, there's this, part seven, plus another, I think, two or even three episodes, maybe as many as ten hours of Macmillan. Look, I live with a guy 24-7, and my waking hours, as few as I hope them to be, are just about enough for me, so... If you were chasing part seven, uh, this would have been the place to do it. And that, perhaps it would have been useful for me to say that at the very beginning of this. We closed, Sean and I, talking about, um, well, how our great uh, computer companies, and well, not just the computer companies, but Google, Facebook, um, Apple services of various kind, have an opportunity to analyze many more things that we do to give them perhaps useful commercial information. And we were talking about the, the keystrokes, how that identifies who you are. Well, I suppose by volume, people are less at their laptops on an actual keyboard than on various kinds of virtual keyboards or the tiny ones on phones. But nonetheless, even if you only use two thumbs, you do that in a characteristic style. It should reveal something about you and your personality. Now, I tell you what, if you're a bit of a conspiracy fan, go out and take a look for any published study on the link between what would you call it, manual dexterity? No, I, I think it's, it's haptics is a technical word, I think, for gestures and movements. But what I'm trying to link is, has anybody tried to measure up what the different method of keystroke tells about a person? And I'm sure the big tech guys have done that. Hmm. And the way most people type is probably, in some senses, the way a piano player plays the little grace notes there, or in my case, the thundering smudges. It might simply be a way of identifying somebody, but don't dismiss it as having no information. A lot of people think that the cameras, that uh, the front-facing ones in their phones and the uh, webcams in their laptops are always on, despite the, the light not being there. But it would generate a lot of data and not much useful stuff. We give away most things anyway that they want to know. After all, most of the commercial information is just how to sell us stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Well, all right, I'll leave at the end of this. And um, <clears throat> something of value? Oh, I don't know. But I'm getting a lot of scams at the moment on my phone. Is it something to do with lockdown opportunities? I don't know, but perhaps. The latest one was, oh, you have a parcel to collect. Didn't say from whom, or what it was, or not even the company that was delivering it. But click on this link and we'll arrange it for you. There was an even worse one a couple of days ago, and on Facebook site kind of crept in on Messenger 
where there was a, a message which is somebody, who knows who, Freddie or something like that, saying, <clears throat> surely this is you in the video. So, oh, yeah, I'd like to know about me. Me's what's important. I'll click on that. Is it me in that video? But <clears throat> it, it wasn't anything of the kind. It was a phony survey um, purporting to be from Facebook itself. Now, if you're like me, I click away from surveys, but it was saying you could win an, <laughs> an iPhone 12 or X or something, and it was only four questions. Now, I should have been alert then that this was too much of an easy game. Either I'd never win a damn thing, or the survey couldn't be... But I'll tell you what, four-question surveys don't tell you much. Though they could if... Well, anyway, but this one, so I fell in, yeah. Um, did I win? I completed the survey and said, oh, here's your chance to win this iPhone. Um, tap on these little prize boxes. Well, almost no matter what you tapped, you seem to have won something somehow. Um, then it goes to another page which says, uh, send us two dollars or two pounds for postage for your iPhone. Oh, yes. Yes. Give me your credit card details there, and we'll send that iPhone off to you. Now, put it this way, even if some people thought, wait, this is too damn lucky, um, they might think, oh, what have I got to lose? A couple of quid, a sore buck, you know, not much. I'll just tap that in there. But, uh, like a ghostly premonition, I saw behind all that a very faint terms and conditions. And looking carefully, I noticed that had I sent my <clears throat> tenth of a score, not only would I have not got any iPhone, it very quickly uh, appeared that there was a, a chance of winning something somewhere. I don't know whether I even bothered with any provision for it. But in sending that postage, not that it was that, you were in fact joining a club which was going to deduct uh, about $50 a month from your bank account or your charge card. Interesting thing, they, the technique's even better. They don't make it 50 a month. You'd sort of notice that. They make it 17 25 every two weeks. You know, that can slip under the radio. Uh, radar, under the radio. Yeah, under the radio. Do you notice something like 17 pounds or say $23 going from your account, you probably would have cut and thought this was something you got. Especially if they make the <clears throat> the person who took the charge something very vague. Anyway, I'm sure people have got um, their own YouTube channels about these sort of scams, but they're so frequent, I'm tempted, only tempted mine to bring out my own. That's enough of me, anyway. <sighs> I should tack on something here. Oh, by the way, uh, I've got Sean to talk to, but by the time you see this, I will have had my new guest uh, for a kind of lockdown diaries. Who will it be? Hmm. I've annoyed five people seriously over it. Which one will I select? Which one will select me? If you got this far and you're watching this now, you'll probably know all about the lockdown tapes. If you don't, or you don't care, give a toss. You can come back for uh, episode 8 of the Sean Atwood, David McMillan interviews, which I'll scratch around for and load up. Meanwhile, do what I should be doing. Get some sleep. Well, good night.